Hey, good morning, church. We're starting a new uh, series today, and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about some of the bigger barriers or obstacles or uh, problems that I've run into when it comes to helping people understand our, our faith, and uh, we're just going to jump right into that. Um, and the, the one that I wanted to talk to you about today is uh, about the reality that when we read Jesus' words, one of the things that he comes to and that he proclaims is that he says that he is the way and the truth and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. And if we will read those words and others like it, it's not just an exception, it's not just one place, but over and over again you find Jesus making those claims and saying that he is the only way in which we can experience the salvation that God wants for us. And um, why that is an obstacle, why that is a barrier, is very simple. That when people hear those words, they begin to ask questions like, well, what does that mean for uh, people who do not believe? It's usually one of the first ones. What does that mean for people who don't believe? If they haven't accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, or if they don't believe in Him, um, what does that mean for their future? What does that mean for their life? Or they'll say, uh, what about other religions? is uh, what does it mean for people who are of other faiths, if they're Muslim or Buddhist, or uh, they check the other box on the sheet, whatever it is, um, what does it mean for them if Jesus is saying that he is the one way, the one truth, and the one life? Um, And so that is what we're going to be talking about, and why that matters so much is that we live in a culture, in a society where more and more you'll hear people say that in order for our culture, our society to be perfect, in order for it to achieve what it needs to, that uh, one of the things that's going to be required is that people don't say things like that, that they don't look at their religion as being the one or the truest form of religion or or anything like that, but rather that uh, we should view other religions as um, journeying along a different path to the same goal. Or they would say that um, it is a matter of really just opinion. I mean, how could you possibly true, prove or, or say that something that Jesus said was true because, you know, who's to say? Uh, how can we really trust that? And so why would we ever uh, have the conviction that um, that, that is the case? Um, and you find more and more people that are struggling with just the basic premise of, of belief. Uh, and when I say that, I, I think about the reality that more and more, um, I'll get phone calls. You're, you're never going to believe this. I get phone calls from time to time from people that um, want me to do a funeral or a wedding or come and say a prayer at a public event. Uh, I know that's not too surprising, but it happens. And, um, you know, that they are going to have a wedding or a funeral or, or something like that. And they, they think, well, you know, it might be good to have a pastor. And so they They'll call me from time to time, and people outside the church especially will call, and they'll say something to the effect of, we want a pastor there, but not a religious one. (laughs) Or, we would like you to be there, but we don't want you to be preachy. Um, Or, if you could come and not mention the name of God, that would work out great. Um, I know, y'all can kind of guess where this is going, right? And, uh, and I'll say, you know, I'm very kind and generous about it, and I'll say something to the effect of, well, well tell me more about that. And, and usually what it comes down to is that they, they want uh, the presence of God, they want a pastor to be there, and they, they just don't want anything to be said about heaven or hell or, or religious convictions, you know? And so I'll just kind of have fun with them. I'll say, you, you do know what I do for a living, right? Um, you know, and I've never done it, but I've always asked, I've always thought to myself, do they, do they, when they call 911, do they go, we want a medical specialist, but we want him to forget everything he knows by the time he gets here? You know, is that how things go for them? Um, but it's not surprising because, like I said, you know, in our society, our culture, more and more of that, the idea, the thought is that it's just impolite, it's offensive to have a, a religious belief, uh, and more so to express it or to say it. Um, I have a, a cousin who I dearly love, and uh, I was talking with him at a family event one time, and uh, he, he's not a believer, he's not a Christian, uh, but he was, you know, trying to do his best to have small talk with me, and he was saying, you know, what I think is great is that you're a Christian pastor, and I'm not a Christian, but, you know, we all kind of believe the same thing, 
Um, we all believe, you know, you should follow the golden rule. You should treat others as you want to be treated. And, you know, all the religions have that as their basis. And, I mean, isn't that great, you know, that we just all kind of believe the same thing? And I, I looked at him. I said, we don't. Um, we don't believe that. I, I love you dearly, but, you know, we don't believe that. And, you know, kind of shared my faith with him that day. Uh, but the idea that he had was, you know, it would be good if we could just, you know, all get along and not have to worry about belief. Um, and uh, later on, you know, I had a conversation with him, and, and he mentioned, you know, he said, I really like the idea of church. I like the idea of community and friends and, and helping other people. If, is there a way to do church without God? And, of course, my answer is no. But more and more you hear that kind of sentiment. Uh, there was a recent Wall Street Journal article one of the church members shared with me, and it talked about the reality that in, you know, like inner city or in some areas that you'll have congregations that are cornerstones of the community, that they're known for doing great things, that they're there to help the poor, that they're there to help those that are in need, and yet uh, their worship numbers are so small and so tiny that they're not able to keep things going as a congregation. And this particular author, I don't believe he's a Christian, but he was uh, talking about how um, he thought that was a shame because uh, you look at our congregation and we help thousands and thousands of people each week from Alcoholics Anonymous to the day school to uh, the ways that we support the community through helping those that are in need, thousands and thousands of people, and yet many of them never come to worship with us, right? And the author, he said, you know, and and that's going to be horrible if churches go away. And so his viewpoint was, wouldn't it be good if we could somehow fund churches but not have to require any kind of belief in who God is? And I was just blown away by that. Uh, the idea that you could have what we have as a congregation and not invite and call and teach about God it just seems absurd to me. So, um, when it comes down to uh, our faith and our belief, like I said, it, it's sometimes a stumbling block for people who are considering to be Christian or people who are and yet are reluctant to ever share their faith uh, in, in outside of their home or outside of their regular circle of friends. Um, there are usually a couple of things that, that come to mind for them. The first is that, that main idea of isn't it exclusive or isn't it arrogant for a Christian to say that their way is the only way? I mean, isn't it, isn't it exclusive, isn't it arrogant for a Christian to say uh, that their way of doing things, their belief, their conviction is the only way or the right way or the true way? Isn't it just unbelievably arrogant and isn't it exclusive, right? That's usually the first opposition, the first complaint that they give you. And then the... Um, there, there's a couple others that go along with it, but before we get too much further, I want to invite you to look at some scripture, uh, and it's found in Acts chapter 4. And um, if you've got your Bibles, you can follow along. And what we're at in this particular passage is that there was a man who had not been able to walk since birth, and uh, some of the disciples, Peter and John, uh, are able to heal him and help him to walk again uh, for the first time. And... Uh, then they have a, a run-in with the local religious authorities. And the local religious authorities are asking the question of how did this happen? And uh, they're upset about it because uh, people are getting excited about what's going on. And so they're, they're worried and they're afraid. And uh, they get before the religious leaders and then it says this. It says, then Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, answered, leaders of the people and elders, are we being examined today because... Something good was done for a sick person, a good deed that healed him. If so, then you and all the people of Israel need to know that this man stands healthy before you because of the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. And so it seems kind of absurd. You would think, well, somebody had a miracle happen in their life. Somebody is able to walk who never could before, and yet the religious people are upset about it. And Peter and the other disciples are basically saying, we, we helped this man, and y'all are, are mad about it. And he says, but the reality is that we, were able, we weren't the ones that did this. It wasn't us that made it happen, but rather it's because of 
who Jesus is, that this miracle happens. And then he goes on to explain who Jesus is. He says, this uh, Jesus the Nazarene who you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone you builders rejected. He has become the cornerstone. Salvation can be found in no one else throughout the whole world. No other name has been given among humans through which must be saved. The council was caught by surprise because the confidence of which Peter and John spoke. After all, they understood that these apostles were uneducated and inexperienced. They also recognized that they had been followers of Jesus. So when we look at that particular passage, we see that um, when they're confronted, when they're faced with this upset group of religious people, that what Peter does is, is not that he becomes arrogant, it's not that he becomes self-righteous, but rather he's just saying, here's how things are. And um, it is just amazing to me, it's such a fun story because, in fact, the religious authorities look at Peter and the other disciples and they say, this is just a bunch of, of regular Joes. These aren't people that have high academic degrees. These are not people that are skilled in persuasion or manipulation, but rather these are just average people. And Peter says, you know, what are we supposed to do? You're the religious authorities. You're the ones that are educated. You're knowledgeable. You know everything. And yet all we can do is say what we saw, what we heard, what we witnessed. He says, you know, the, the Jesus, the, the Nazarene, the one that you... Uh, crucified, the one that you put to death and that was raised from the dead, he's the one that we follow. He says, you, you may have all the degrees, it may make perfect sense to you, uh, you might have an understanding of what God is capable of, but uh, I think we're going to go with the guy who was raised from the dead and that we watched ascend into heaven, you know. I think we're going to stick with him. And so Peter says that, and he gives them that, that testimony, and he says, this is, this is what we believe, this is what we think is right and what is good. And um, recognize, you know, it's not like Peter's saying, because of the good things that we did, Jesus came and did this for us. He's not saying because we're superior or because of our background or, or anything like that. He's saying, this is what God did in Jesus Christ. This is what we believe to be true about him. And uh, we can't help but, but be amazed by what Jesus is doing. And uh, the people in the crowds could kind of say, well, well, who's right? Is it the religious authorities or is it these disciples, and then there's this guy who just can't stop grinning because he can walk. You know, who are we going with? And so that was what we find in this particular passage is they're saying, this is what we believe, this is what we saw, and this is how it happened. And it says, they also recognized that they had been followers of Jesus. However, since the healed man was standing with Peter and John before their own eyes, they had no rebuttal. So they've got this person who's been healed, who's been uh, saved, who's been helped, and they have the witness of Peter. What's also beautiful about this is Peter denied Jesus three times. He messed up. He made his mistakes. He has his flaws. And yet he has no choice but to stand in front of them and say, but because of Jesus, we believe these things to be true. Well, so what? What does that mean for us? Well, when it comes to the argument of you can't really say that one religion is superior to the other and that the best way for us to get along is for us just to acknowledge that we're all journeying on separate paths to the same goal when it comes to our religion. I just want to point out to you that that in itself is a, a position. It's a viewpoint, right? If you're saying that your way of thinking is the right way and that all others are wrong, you're basically in the same boat as I am, right? If you have the belief and the conviction and you say that the best way for things to be done is for us to just acknowledge that all religions are equal, that all of them are doing the same thing, uh, that they're all accomplishing the same goal, uh, then that is your belief, that's your conviction, that's your viewpoint. And that I have the right, and every Christian does as well, to express our particular views about our faith and our belief as well. Right? Y'all are slow in this because of the culture and society we live in, right? Where we say, oh, no, no, that's, that's not how we do things. But you're, you're taking hold of it and you're saying that my viewpoint, my belief that all religions are equal is better than how you view things. So you're doing the same thing that I am. And the fun thing about it is that if you talk with people of other religions, they do the same thing, right? Um, I was uh, 
when my wife and I found out that we were going to be uh, adopting and having our second kid around those same time, about that same time to where we had went from zero to two kids in the span of about seven months, uh, one of the realities that hit home was that my uh, subcompact car was no longer going to work for our family. Because not only do you have to carry the two kids, but then there's the carriers, the diapers, the playpen. You know, we were new parents. We carried everything with us. And, um, and so we, we found it was time to trade in and, and do one of the most horrible things that ever happened. We purchased a minivan. It was, it was brutal. And um, I remember going to the dealership and, you know, we did the normal run around on price and all that. And we were at a place where um, I think my wife had taken the kids to the bathroom or something like that. And the salesman was on the part of the sales pitch where he goes away to talk to the manager for that final offer, right? And so um, he had gone back and he'd come back and he was waiting on my wife to pitch the final thing. And he began to talk with me and he said, so what do you do? I said, I'm a Christian pastor. He said, oh, that's great. He said, I'm a Muslim. He said, okay. Um, and I said, we were just kind of talking about family and things like that. And he said, you know, you and I, we, we just believe the same thing. And I said, nope, no, we don't. So he said, no, 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 we like Jesus. He's a, he's a good person. He's, we like him. And I said, I, I understand, but we do not believe the same thing. And I began to share with him my faith and talk with him about those things. And and I don't know where that ended up with him, but at the end of the day, I was tell- thinking, you know, that's just how things are in our culture, that so many people believe that uh, we're all the same, that we have the same things, and then you run into Jesus' words, and all of a sudden, you can't believe that. Because if you read his words, if you hear what he says about himself, over and over again, he, you hear him say, I am the way and the truth and the life. At no point does he ever say, I am one way among many. I am a life, but there's others like it, right? Over and over again, he he speaks and he says, no, I am the way to the Father. And what does that mean for you and I? Well, one thing I, I think we could agree upon, one, it's not a matter of being better than anybody else or superior to anyone else, that when we talk about the gospel, we're saying that our lives were so wrecked and devastated and destroyed by sin and death that we had to have a Savior. That we're not coming to this from a standpoint of because we were so good, Jesus came back and, and saved us. But we're going in from a standpoint of because we were so far from God, because we had messed up so often, that we had made so many mistakes, that we needed a Savior to come into our hearts and our lives to redeem and to heal us and to bring us into eternal life. And that if we have that understanding, then any conversation we have with somebody from a different religion is going to come from a standpoint of humility, of openness, of grace and mercy. And that we also recognize and we see that because of what Jesus said and what he had to say about himself, that we don't really have much choice but to share who we are as a people and to share our faith. Uh, when I was in college, I took a course on world religions and they brought in various representatives from the religions we were studying. And I still remember very clearly, we had a couple of people that were from the Jewish faith and they came forward and they shared about their beliefs and their convictions and it's really beautiful faith. Um, but At the end of it, they said, you know, as a Jewish people, chances are our grandchildren aren't going to be Jewish, and we don't have any convictions or beliefs that we need to share our faith with anybody else. And then he said something that I never have forgotten. He said, I sure wish you Christians would go and do likewise, right? And I understand where he's coming from. He probably got sick of hearing people talk about his faith. But in the back of my mind, I thought, I have no choice. I have no choice. If I believe Jesus, if I take him at his word, if I believe he is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, then I have no choice but to be a person that says, he is Lord, he is my Savior. I would never deny him in front of other people because I don't want to get to the end of it and have him deny me. 
I have no choice when it comes to my beliefs that he is the way and the truth and the life and that he is the one that I have to proclaim and to teach and to, to share with other people. And I do so not just because those are his words, but I, because I've seen it over and over again, the way that he is able to heal and redeem and restore the most desperate and broken lives imaginable, even good lives, perfectly great, nice, suburban, comfortable lives. He can redeem those people too. And over and over again, I have seen that at work, and how could I ever stop telling people about him? So it's not a matter of thinking of it being better or thinking of it as superior, but rather it's a matter of this is who I believe Jesus said he was, and this is what he told those who were following to do, and that's what it means for my faith in my life. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, this is something that we all will uh, face or struggle with from time to time, whether it is a person of another belief or faith system or just somebody that does not have much belief in anything these days. Uh, they are part of our lives and part of our world, and we are so thankful for them. We pray and ask in this time that you would can help us to continue to study your word and to think about the, the meaning of it. What does it mean for you to be the only way that people can find salvation and eternal life? Help us to hold that in our hands with the kind of humility and grace that you have called us to, and help us to find ways to share that with others. In Christ's name we